All right, good evening, guys. Um, welcome to chapter eight, real estate finance. Uh, we only got three people online and then one person in class, so we're gonna we're, we're still waiting for a, a couple people, but we're gonna go ahead and get started. So um, I don't run y'all off uh, too late tonight. Um, today, we're gonna be talking about government loans here. Um, as y'all can see on the screen, uh, we're gonna start out with uh, only one YouTube video today, fortunately. Uh, so we're just going to start out with this real quick um, and then uh, get into the lecture it should be pretty quick uh, for class so we'll start with this hello everyone welcome to the home Art webinar and today we're talking about the differences between fha va conventional and usda types of financing now chances are if you're a home buyer and you'll begin to talk to lenders about your home loan you're going to people online uh first off can i get your cameras and then also, can y'all hear that? It's coming out of a different audio source. So are y'all good on hearing that or no? Yeah, we can hear it. I get thumbs up, down. Joe, could you hear that? You could? Okay, cool. All right, now I'll get back to it. We'll land one of these four options. So let's take a look at what they are. FHA. FHA stands for the Federal Housing Administration. And it's been around since 1934. VA, which is overseen by the US Department of Veterans Affairs, oversees everything to do with veterans. Conventional is overseen by Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, and we'll explain shortly what those are. And USDA, which is overseen by the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Now, before we can really understand these different types of loans, we need to take a step back and get an understanding of how, historically, um, home loans have been provided and sustained in this country. Now, when a loan is funded, the investment made by that bank is backed by an investor. Now, this means that rather than having to wait 30 years to get the original principal balance and the interest uh, back, the bank can make some immediate money by selling the right to collect those interest payments to an investor. And, and that investor is in it for the long haul. Now, in other words, another investor comes in, buys the debt, and the right to collect payments on it. Now, why is this important? It's important because the local bank, the mortgage company, or credit union can make their money back immediately and return them to the business of helping the next home buyer without tying up their money for 15 to 30 years, which is an awful long time. Now, how do banks get their money back immediately, and how do they continue to provide loans? Now, historically, what the banks did was reach out to a middleman that bought these loans, thousands of them, thousands of them, good loans, bad loans, all mixed up together, and then they, they played the role of finding investors for these loans all across the world. Now, imagine these mortgage loans as the red apples, green apples, yellow apples, bad apples, good apples, old apples, organic apples, all mixed up in one bag. And the middleman takes that bag and slices it up in little bags, small groups of loans, and sells them to end investors all over the world. Now, the middleman, by playing that role, enables both the big and small banks to keep lending money because there's always a constant supply of cash to come and replenish the money that they went out. Now, in the U.S., historically, there have been three big companies that played that middleman role, or they backed private companies that played the role. Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, and GD May. Now, let's talk about the last one first, GD May. GD May stands for Government National Mortgage Association. It's actually the government agency within HUD. Now, GD May backs certain types of mortgages that are bought all over the world. The end investor who buys the loans, whether they're a, a pension fund in Germany or an insurance company in China, for example, those end investors carry less risk because the full faith and credit of the U.S. government is behind these loans that are bought and sold. Now, essentially, the U.S. government is guaranteeing the monthly payments to the holder of that bag of apples <laughs> the pool of mortgages. Now, what does this mean on the street? How does this affect the home buyer qualifying for a mortgage? Get this. Loans backed by Ginny May carry more flexible underwriting guidelines and lower interest rates for better pricing. And we'll explain to you in just a little bit why. Now, unlike Ginny May, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, the other two companies that are playing that role, that middleman role of buying and selling mortgages in bulk, they have government oversight and often even government intervention, like we've seen in 2011, 2010, but they are not actual government agencies. The loans that they buy and sell across the world are not 100% backed by the US government. And so their standards and their guidelines are tighter. Now, which loans are backed by GMA and in which not? In other words, for which loans does our federal government come in and provide a guarantee to the end investors saying, hey, if payments stop coming in, we will step in and make good. Which are those loans? The answer, FHA, VA, 
and the USDA. And this makes those mortgages less risky to the investors, which in turn means lower pricing on the street, better and easier qualifying for the borrower and the home buyer on the street. Now, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac uh, overseeing loans are considered conventional. Now, in 2011 and 2010, and I don't want to go off the tangent here, the government actually announced that Fannie and Freddie will gradually be you know, phased out, wound out. Uh, and this is going to leave our economy, depending on other sources, to play that role of providing for mortgage money to the banks by packaging those pools of mortgages and selling them off to investors all over the world. Okay, let's take a look at that chain. As we've already said, because the lender has the full backing and guarantee of the U.S. government behind the loan, they can tolerate more risk and allow lower down payments than ever when considering FHA financing. Now, there's different types of FHA mortgages, but the most common is the FHA 203B, which has a 30-year and a 15-year fixed loan option. Now, let's look at the pros and the cons of FHA financing. Those are the pros. Lower down payments as low as 3.5%, allowing for 96.5% financing flexible and forgiving underwriting standards, including two years from a bankruptcy discharge and three years from a foreclosure. FHA allows for non-occupant co-borrowers, in other words, typically family members, uh, to come in and co-sign for a borrower without even intending to live in the property. And what FHA allows is for the lender to blend the total income of all the borrowers and the total debt of all the borrowers. And in doing so, the strength of the non-occupant borrower and even out the weaknesses of the occupant part. Now, less credit debt is still accepted. Uh, it's not always necessary to have a high five or square. In fact, FHA loans can be made to borrowers who have no traditional credit, uh, such as you know, credit cards, student loans, and auto loans, and, and so on and so forth. FHA loans can be made to borrowers that have non-traditional credit, such as utilities, uh, rent history, car insurance, cell phone subscriptions, so on and so forth. Now, FHA allows the seller to give up closing cost concessions up to 6%, even at the highest levels of value of 96.5%, and we'll see in a little bit uh, how that's unique. The entire down payment from the body can be gifted. This is in stark contrast to conventional loans, where typically at least the first 5% of the down payment has to come from the buyer's own funds. Now, with FHA, certain debts, if they're deferred, can be taken out, eliminated from the monthly payment obligations, such as, for example, student loans. FHA have a streamlined feature whereby after six timely payments, if the market rates have dropped, the FHA loan can be refinanced without an appraisal and with very lean credit qualifying to the lower interest rates. It's very attractive. It, it's, uh, it's, it's a way for borrowers to get into the FHA program, and if the rates are growing, the market improves, they can uh, take advantage of that drop in monthly payment without having to go through a full loan refinance. Finally, when we're talking about pros of FHA financing, FHA loans don't require any cash reserves in the bank. Even $1 or what's needed for down payment and closing costs to close the transaction is perfectly acceptable. Cons, let's look at some of the negatives. Um, FHA can involve uh, the appraiser being a little bit pickier on the condition of the property. Now, there are restrictions on buying homes that are being quickly resold for profit. In fact, we have a whole other video, a pull by webinar tutorial on FHA flips where the seller has not owned the property for 90 days. Uh, the seller's reselling the property for profit within 90 days of acquiring it, and you want to take a look at the details there. Mortgage insurance on FHA loans continues for a minimum of five years, even on a 30-year term. And, and there's an upfront mortgage insurance and an annual mortgage insurance. Now, in the nine community property states, Arizona, California, Nevada, Idaho, Louisiana, New Mexico, Texas, Washington and Wisconsin, the spouse's debts have to be considered, which can often lower the amount the individual will qualify for. So even if you if you're borrowing and your spouse is not going to borrow on the loan, she's not going to sign or he's not going to sign on the notes, um, his or her debts, monthly payments have to be counted against you, and that can lower your, your buying power cost. Now the loan limits set for the counties of involving FHA financing are typically lower than what's set by Fannie and Freddie Mac in the same counties in conventional loans. Now, uh, for example, up until recently, the, uh, the maximum amount of conventional was uh, 417000 in, in many areas of the country. That is, it cannot be used to finance investment properties for certain homes. Let's talk about conventional homes. Conventional interest rates tend to be a little bit higher because even though, as we said before, a government-sponsored enterprise, i.e. Fannie or Freddie, backs and buys these homes, it's technically not the government that's guaranteeing them. Therefore, there's a little bit more risk to the investor. 
which is reflected in the interest rate pricing adjustments. For example, there are adjustments uh, to the interest rate for things like loan to value. Uh, you know, for example, an 85 percent loan to value uh, would have a higher interest rate more than likely than an 80 percent uh, size of loan. In other words, the loan amount, uh, FICA score, higher FICA scores, they have, they have better pricing than lower FICA scores. Occupancy status, uh, a loan requested to purchase a home as a vacation or a second home is going to have a little bit worse pricing than owner occupying property pricing. Uh, and of course, the property type has an effect on the pricing as well. We'll talk about mention. Now, let's look at the pros and cons of conventional financing. Pros, there are less rigorous property appraisal requirements, there's no upfront mortgage insurance, there are higher loan amounts typically, and here's a really good one. The spouse's debts do not have to be counted against the borrower when qualifying. So if, you, if your spouse or significant other has uh, monthly debts that are not reflected on your credit report, that does not have to lower your buying power. And finally, there's no mortgage insurance if you borrow more than 80% or above. And that's the comparison to FHA, where with FHA, even at 80% value, uh, you have mortgage insurance for the first five years. Okay, let's look at the cons and disadvantages of uh, conventional financing. Typically, longer waiting times since derogatory events such as bankruptcy, foreclosure, short sale, being a new foreclosure, so on and so forth. Stricter credit requirements and tougher underwriting rules. Typically, borrowers in conventional financing have to have pretty good credit history and then high credit scores. Private mortgage insurance, also known as PMI, is not automatic for conventional financing. Now, there are various PMI companies such as General Earth, NGIC, Radio, and so on and so forth. It works the conventional underwriter and the mortgage company has approved the file. The PMI company itself has to underwrite the file according to their standards before the mortgage insurance certificate can be issued. So it's not always automatic. And there are instances where the loan will get approved by the underwriter and the PMI company won't uh, will can't issue the mortgage insurance certificate. You pretty much have a dead deal. Another con is that non occupant call borrowers are not allowed on the loan to buy transactions. Is, this is different than we change on this test. Borrowers with no scores by no credit cannot be approved typically. And they may have to resort to special conventional programs or niche programs that carry higher interest rates, such as my community. There's less of a tolerance for high debt ratios. In fact, the automated system that Fannie Mae uses, known as DU, uh, that you might uh, have heard about, uh, has become tighter and tighter over the years, where uh, higher debt ratios that used to pass through are now getting you know, stopped at the door. Typically, you're going to have to have a, a debt ratio of 45% or less to be able to get through on a conventional loan. Now, until the loan to value drops to 80%, the seller can only contribute 3% of the purchase price towards the closing cost. Let's take a look at VA. VA loans are for those who have or are presently serving in the armed forces of the U.S. If discharged, that discharge must be something other than dishonorable, as shown on the 8214 separation papers for a veteran. The Department of VA actually gives the lender a guarantee up to 25% of the loan amount. So this usually means if the home were foreclosed and the lender ended up selling it at 75% of value, it would still make that okay because it would recover the other 25% directly from the VA. Now, in order to obtain a, a loan guaranteed by the Department of VA, the veteran must provide what's called a COE, if you take a look at your screen, uh, also known as a certificate of eligibility, it looks something like this. Now, the COE is something your lender uh, actually can get for you through the internet, through online, uh, as long as you provide the credit data. The COE, the certificate of eligibility, actually shows the entitlement amount that is relevant to that veteran. And then there's a magic formula that takes that entitlement and turns it into a maximum loan amount in that county for that veteran, uh, up to 100% financing. For example, uh, you know, recently in California, uh, uh, in most counties had at least 417,000 um, a max loan amount. And some counties had as high as 625,000. Uh, and up north in Cal Northern California, some of the more affluent counties, if you would, uh, the veteran could borrow up to a million dollars with no money down. Pretty amazing. Now, the VA helps cover the administrative cost of the program by charging a one time upfront VA funding fee. For the first time user, uh, first time veteran user, this was recently 2.15% of the loan amount. That's a repeat user as high as 3.3%. Now, let's talk about the pros and cons of VA finance and pros. The cost, just like FHA, VA loans are ultimately backed by none other than the U.S. government, Ginny May. The rates tend to be lower, 
and risk new credit profiles are accepted. Now, veterans with bankruptcies as recent as two years and even foreclosures as recent as two years old can be eligible for VA financing. They can borrow 100% of the purchase price. The seller can pay not only 4% towards the customer closing costs, but check this out, folks, but also another 4% towards concessions, such as paying off the veteran's debts that they will be able to qualify. Pretty amazing. In other words, the seller can assist in paying off the veteran's credit card debt, for example, to help that veteran qualify. So if you add four and four together, that's a total of 8% of the purchase price in seller concessions that can be given up. Very attractive for veterans to get it along with, uh, with VA financing. No cash reserves are needed. The VA can be funded for widows of deceased veterans who never remarried. Veterans without credit scores or traditional credit can be eligible as well, just like with FHA, as we discussed earlier. There is no mortgage insurance, even at 100% financing. This makes it very attractive. No MI, there's no upfront MI, and there's no annual MI for VA financing. And finally, veterans with service related disabilities, 10% uh, disability, can have their VA funding fee waived if they can uh, document that. And that means they end up borrowing exactly 100% of the purchase price and, and uh, nothing more. Cons. What are some of the negatives in, uh, with regard to VA financing? Only veterans or their spouses can be on the loan. No one else. You can't have a girlfriend, boyfriend, a family member, uh, and you sort of can't have a non occupant co borrower, uh, whereas you can with FHA. Now, in the community property states, uh, the spouse's debt, just like with FHA loans we mentioned earlier, has to be counted and can lower the buying count. The property is rigorously inspected by the VA appraiser. In fact, some sellers tend to react unfavorably because of the stigma associated with VA loans for that reason. And it takes a good skilled loan officer to get on the phone, get on the phone with the seller and or the seller's agent, and uh, reassure them regarding VA financing. Because quite honestly, it's really not that bad. And a lot of the VA loans that we've been involved with have closed smoothly and quicker than even FHA or conventional financing. Finally, obviously, you have to be a veteran, uh, you know, in active duty or serving the National Guard to be able to get a VA loan. It's not for everyone. Finally, USDA loans. Let's talk about USDA loans. USDA loans are guaranteed by the U.S. Department of Agriculture, and they give the lender assurance that they will guarantee up to 90% of the amount of the loan in the event of default. Now, in response to this uh, guarantee by the USDA, lenders will lend 100% of the purchase price, and sometimes even more than 100% of the purchase price, if the appraisal supports a higher value than the contract price which we buy and sell it. Pretty amazing. And this makes the USDA loan unique amongst the big four loans. Let's take a look at some of the pros of USDA financing. 100% financing, no money down. Flexible underwriting guidelines such as FHA. There is no loan amount limit. I mean, don't think you know that. There is no limit on the loan amount. That's an awesome thing and stands that apart from FHA and conventional financing. There's no limit on the loan amount. The borrower is only limited by how much they can afford. There is no cash reserves needed. The seller can pay an unlimited amount in closing costs unless the amount being paid is abnormal for the area or for the market. But again, it's not uncommon for USDA financing to involve, you know, seven or eight percent seller concessions. Lower credit scores, typically 620 or sometimes even lower than that, uh, are accepted by lenders for USDA financing, and even buyers with no score and no traditional credit can be approved. Now, here's a good one: repairs can be financed in with the USDA purchase loan up to ten thousand dollars. Now, this enables a buyer to purchase a home that needs a little bit of renovation without having to come up with their own cash. Thing. So $10,000 is funded on top of the loan, and those funds are held in escrow uh, or an escrow account uh, for the work to be completed, typically within 30 days of closing. Now, income from a second job can be used when you're doing USDA financing, uh, used for qualifying purposes, even if there's a one-year history of it, uh, which is pretty special compared to FHA or convention. Uh, so if you've got a second job and you've got documented income from it, um, on a USDA loan, you can use that income with only a one-year history. And the last thing here we're going to talk about uh, under the, uh, the category of pros is the mortgage insurance that's now imposed on USDA loans as of October 2011 is to be declining with each passing year as the loan principal balance goes down. But that's unique compared to FHA mortgage insurance. The USDA mortgage insurance, which is 0.3% per year, the dollar amount is going to decline because it's always based on the principal balance of the loan in that year. Cons, negatives of USDA financing. Obviously, only owner occupied uh, properties are eligible. Uh, non occupant coal borrowers are not allowed. There are income limitations based on the number of persons in the household and the county 
that the property is being purchased in. And uh, be sure to look at some of our other uh, more detailed USDA uh, home buying webinars available on the blog and the YouTube channel to uh, get the uh, big details on that. But there are income limitations. There are also geographic restrictions. So only properties in eligible areas can be financed. Again, check our YouTube channel and our blog to understand uh, how to read the USDA eligibility map and how to find out which areas are eligible and which are not. I should say this, all 50 states have eligible areas for the USDA loan. Now, after the initial underwrite by the lender, the USDA field office has to do a second uh, brief mini underwrite of the file before the conditional commitment can be issued. And that's what allows the file to go through the closing. And sometimes, not always, this can result in slight delays along the processing times, and you should be aware of that. Now, unlike conventional loans in community property states, the spouse's debts need to be counted against the borrower, just like FHA and VA loans. Bankruptcy need to be three years old, whereas FHA and VA allow a two years holding on period for bankruptcy. Thanks for watching, folks. Uh, I hope you found this video. Uh, All right. So there's our YouTube video for the day. Hope y'all enjoyed it. Learning about them, those government loans. So yeah, uh, today we're going to be going into the government loans that were discussed in that video, uh, just into a little bit, uh, maybe not more detail, but just kind of go over them, uh, just a little more review. Uh, so starting off, um, FHA insured loans. Uh, now, you know, when talking about uh, government loans as compared to conventional, um, government loans are going to be about 70 to 80 percent of what you deal with um, once you get your, gain your real estate license. Um, the majority of people uh, that you're going to deal with are, are there's going to be a lot of first-time home buyers. Um, they're not going to meet the, the requirements of banks. Um, so, you know, what they're going to do is uh, you know, they, don't, they don't meet the qualifications um, of the bank. So what they're going to do is they're going to turn to the government because, um, like you said in that video, through FHA, uh, VA, USDA, I mean, you can get you can purchase a house with very, very little down payment. Uh, so it's a lot cheaper up front. Uh, you're not having to pay. Uh, you know, typically when you ask people how much do you have to put down when you buy a home, uh, they think, oh, I have to put down 20%. I have to put down 25%. Um, well, that's not true. Obviously, we just saw a couple there uh, through VA uh, and USDA. Um, VA obviously is zero, zero down. Um, so any kind of uh, any veteran, uh, you tell them that they can get a house for zero dollars down. I mean, they're going to be pretty pumped, pretty pumped and excited about that. So, um, along with USDA, um, and you know, in, in the USDA loans, uh, you would think. That it has to be out in uh, Hereford, Texas. Do any of y'all know where Hereford, Texas is? Yeah, it's out there in the middle of nowhere. It's a small town, uh, cow town. Um, it, I mean, it doesn't have to be just for um, agricultural land. Actually, um, here between in South College Station, between College Station and Wilburn, um, a lot of that land is actually USDA approved. Uh, so it doesn't have to be, you know, out in the middle of nowhere for you to be able to approve for a USDA loan. Um, it's just, just areas of property, or I mean, how? Well, so you, the USDA only, um, they have certain parts of land, like mm -hmm. there's there's specific uh, places out in that that region that are USDA approved. The USDA approves their land beforehand. Um, so it's not like you can go just buy a house and get a USDA loan. It has to be in a, a USDA pre-approved site, um, and then you're able to get it through there. Um, but you know, like it said in the video, uh, you can get a US if you are able to obtain a USDA loan, uh, you can get it for as low as zero to five hundred dollars down. Um, so you know, people telling somebody that they can get a house for five hundred dollars down, that's pretty. That's going to be pretty appetizing to them. It's going to hurt hurt their ears up quite a bit. So. Um, you know, uh, in talking about FHA insured loans, the insurance part, um, they are, it's a program of mortgage insurance and it is directed by HUD. Um, it insures loans made by local lenders. Um, and this was switched over uh, post 08 um, to say uh, why it has a bank and he has $10 billion in that bank. 
And you know, the, econ the economy uh, back in 08, it was downturn. Um, you didn't know who was going to be able to afford uh, a house, who you could lend to, and who was going to pay you back. Um, so, I mean, were you back in that time where you didn't know kind of the, you know, where the economy was going or, you know, where we are headed, were you um, very willing to give out risky loans to people who maybe wouldn't pay them back? No, of course not. Um, but if you're not gonna, if you're not handing out loans to people who need them to buy houses, there's no way to re-stimulate the economy uh, and get it back running. You know, we need people spending money um, to make yeah to get everything going back again. So um, that's why the FHA uh, they came in and they uh, they became the like the insurer of loans. So if people defaulted. Um, you know, their, their loans were obviously repaid by the FHA uh, to those lenders, uh, trying to keep that account, keep the economy going. Um, talking about, you know, uh, the requirements for an FHA insured loan, uh, the application um, is very stringent um, on their requirements. Uh, they will, um, you will, after you fill out your, your application, uh, they'll come through it with a fine tooth um, fine tooth comb, they'll go through it with a fine tooth comb uh, and make sure everything is correct. Make sure your employment, your income, your credit score, everything that we've talked about, they'll make sure it is up to par and up to their standards. Um, so they, to, in, to let them insure that loan. Um, they're not just gonna insure uh, crappy loans handed out to people who don't, you know, don't deserve them or are getting too much. Um, so they're very stringent on their application process. Um, appraisal the appraisal is is very very important um, obviously you know when you're if you're going to insure a loan you're going to want to make sure your uh, the, the loan amount that's given is correct with the property so once the sell of that property is made uh, you're going to get your money back uh, and you're not gonna you're not gonna lose it a ton of, you know, that's why that's why we have appraisers now um, and so we're not giving out you know, three, four hundred thousand dollar loans on one hundred fifty thousand dollar houses because that's is what used to happen, and uh, you know that's kind of what sent, uh, sent our economy into the down tick that it did, and what caused the 08 financial crisis. So, the appraisal is key uh, among FHA insured and basically all loans uh, that are given nowadays. The appraisal is is very important. Um, home inspection. Uh, here with FHA insured, um, home inspection is recommended, but it is not required. Um, I don't know why they put it under this in this slide under requirements and then said it was recommended. Um, it is not required under FHA, but it is highly recommended that you get a home inspection. Um, even just as a re regular buyer of a house, uh, you're going to want to get your home inspected regardless. Uh, you're going to want to make sure there's no problems with the foundation, there's no problems with the roof, uh, there's no wood. WDIs is what we call them, WDI inspection, which is destroying insects, um, termites, that is. Uh, you're, so inspections are very, very important um, and key. You, uh, you know, why talking about inspections, um, after you get an inspection done, should you ever uh, give your inspection report to the lender? Hell no. No, yeah, exactly, you're right. Um, you know, a lot of times as an agent, you're going to be, uh, you know, working with a loan on the buyer side. Uh, you're going to get all your inspections done, and the lender's going to, you know, shoot you a call, give, shoot you a text, uh, whatever, and they're going to say, you know, hey, how's it going? Just make sure everything's good. Uh, you you think it's just a friendly conversation, and then they say, um, you know, can I get a copy? How how did the inspections go? You say they went well, whatever, and they're going to ask, can I get a copy of that inspection report? Uh, your answer should always be no. Uh, of course, I'm sorry, I can't. I, I'll have to ask my clients. Is, is what I typically say. Sorry, I'll uh, I'll ask my clients, and and if so, then I, yeah, I'll shoot that over to you, um, and just kind of you know put it off on the clients so they think you're going to ask them, but you'll never send it over to uh, send an inspection report uh, to the lender. Um, can anybody online uh, maybe give me a reason as to why you wouldn't want to send a lender? I mean, your inspection report. Anyone know? Can anyone give a guess? No. It's a difficult question. Why do you have a guess? 
because if you send it to them, they would probably like with the money they win, you they would expect their you know expect them, the problems to be like solved. Exactly. Yeah. 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 So they're gonna get that inspection report. I mean, you're absolutely nailing them tonight. <laughs> you know, uh, yeah, they'll get that. They'll ask for that inspection report, and if you send it over to them, they're gonna see um, that there was some stuff wrong in the you know the garage door was was a little bit ajar. Uh, they're gonna see that there were multiple holes in the wall. They're gonna see that the carpet was ripped up in one place. Uh, they're gonna see that the tile was cracked and maybe that some of the baseboards were missing. Well, before they lend you that money now, they're gonna want all those repairs done. They're gonna want to make sure that the loan amount, um, that the house is worth the loan amount. And with those repairs needing to be done, it, it probably isn't, it, I mean, it's, it's gonna be relatively the same, uh, but banks or lenders are just the worst and they want everything fixed. They want to make sure that uh, the property is in tip top shape and is the best possible condition. So um, yeah, just a little bit of advice. Um, once you get your license, the lender ever, ever asks you, hey, can I get that inspection report? No, sir, I'm sorry, not today. Uh, and they'll keep bugging you and keep bugging you for it. And you just keep telling them no. Uh, you are not required by any means to give the inspection report to the lender. Um, and if it's not required and it's not beneficial, there's no reason to do it. So, I mean, it can only be harmful to you and your clients. Um, once the, um, they start requesting a bunch of repairs to be made, uh, then you either have to dig out of your own pocket and pay for them, or you're going to make the seller dig out of their pocket and pay for them. And that's a, that's a good way to make a transaction fall through when everything was going smoothly and then somebody has to pull out uh, you know, pay five to ten thousand um, dollars out of their pocket for uh, for repairs made to the house that were um, that aren't you know any they don't cause any destruction or harm to the property. Uh, they don't actually drop it in value, uh, but the lender just wants it done. So never uh, in talking about inspections, never ever ever get an inspection court to uh, your lender. Um, you know, and then talking about uh, mortgage insurance, uh, which here is um, MIP. Uh, can anybody online now, uh, why was unable to be in class yesterday, so somebody online is going to have to chime in here. Uh, he's not going to be able to save you. Oh, can anybody tell me what uh, PMI yesterday stood for uh, in our lecture? PMI. Was it private mortgage insurance? Yes. Yeah, private mortgage insurance. Thank you. Um, so that's just, uh, as you remember, it's a premium that you pay on the loan um, and to, to ensure that loan in case of default. Um, now, mortgage insurance here is MIP. Uh, so if you want to make a little note to yourself, PMI um, is referring to conventional loans and MIP is in regards to FHA insured loans. Um, now, anybody um, besides Shelton online, uh, can you tell me at what point uh, the PMI falls off on a conventional loan yesterday? We talked about it. It's when, when you hit that certain percentage of down payment, does anybody remember what that percentage was? Less than 20%. 20, yeah. Yeah, so like we said yesterday, um, at 20%, well, once you paid pay down 20% of your loan, um, you, you need to call because the lender, they like to make money. Uh, you can call and get that PMI dropped. Um, but in the case of FHA insured loans, uh, the MIP, uh, it will never be dropped. It stays uh, throughout the life of the loan. You'll continue to pay MIP until your last payment. Um, so that is a downfall of FHA insured loans. But um, as you saw in the video, there are a lot of benefits to them as well. Um, now, and then talking about Title I uh, in regards to FHA insured loans, uh, you can make alterations, repairs, and site improvement. Also, um, it does uh, cover manufactured homes, but it is very, very, very difficult to uh, get a FHA loan um, on a manufactured home. Um, even if there's, you know, the, the manufactured home is on, you know, 150 acres, and the, the price of the land is not, you're not really buying the, the manufactured home, you're buying the land. Um, it's still difficult to secure an FHA loan 
um, on that property because they don't do well with uh, manufactured homes. Uh, it's, it's a little easier if you if you have a double wide and you're trying to get that uh, get a mortgage for a double wide. Um, but really, if you're if you're uh, talking about manufactured homes, it's best to just go to the dealer themselves, um, haggle with price there, and buy it there. It's it's just um, and then pay on there. You know they'll loan obviously give you the property and then you pay them um, over time. A lot easier to do it that way. It's it's hard to get a government loan on a manufactured home because they don't hold um, a whole lot of value. And uh, to to secure any kind of government loan on a, a manufactured home, it has to be. Um, sealed to the ground. It has to be permanent in that in that spot. Um, it can't be one of the something that you just pick up and move it uh, when you, once you're done. Um, it has to be a permanent permanent resident. So uh, something to just keep in mind there. Um, FHA Title II, uh, the commonly used programs there. Uh, you know we have um, of these three. Um, why? Which one uh, do you think? you're going to use uh, the most often. The, the 203B, that deals with the one to four family, the 203K, which is the rehab plus purchase, and the 251, which is a one year arm. So one to four family. Yeah, yeah. So uh, the majority of the time dealing with FHA, uh, you're going to see a lot of two of, uh, section 203B, um, and that is in regards to the one to four family contract. Uh, I mean, yeah, y'all uh, y'all know all about the one to four family. Y'all went over it like 30 times the last class. Um, so that shouldn't be any surprise to you. Uh, the 203K, uh, the rehabilitation plus purchase. We'll talk about this a little more in the, um, a little more in the lecture. Uh, but the 203K is, is typically used for, um, if you're gonna, you're gonna buy it, maybe live in it for a couple months, flip it, uh, you know, renovate it, build it up, build it nice. And uh, then sell it off for a profit. That's uh, that's what you use at FHA two hundred three k section two hundred three k uh, loan for. Um, and then section two fifty one. That's that one year arm. Um, and everybody online uh, that was here yesterday, uh, do we feel good? Thumbs up or thumbs down? Do we feel good about arms? Those adjustable rate mortgages. Do we like uh, arms or not? Anybody remember? Yeah, yeah, so down. We do not like arms, those adjustable rate mortgages. Um, they are the worst. They, um, they'll they get you you know, caught up with the, the bait um, interest rate, like I was talking about yesterday. They'll get you with a really, really low interest rate to start off. Um, and then each year, we'll talk about these a little more uh, later on in this lecture as well. Um, each year, they'll kind of hike up those prices, um, hike up that interest rate because it is adjustable. Um, and, and you know, eventually you're paying uh, two to three percent more than if you would assign just a regular um, fixed rate loan. So um, we try to stay away from the arms as much as possible. Um, and then the specials; uh, these are just basically um, incentives um, for FHA loans. Uh, an energy efficient mortgage or an EEM. Um, you know, this is if you want to buy a house and you want to go green with it and you know you you want to uh it's you have to show show kind of your idea for the house and your floor plans and that kind of thing to make sure it is energy efficient um and if you do qualify for it um you it's basically a discounted mortgage so you know putting in green windows green appliances all that's obviously going to be a little more expensive um so they try to like counteract that with this uh, the EEM mortgage, um, trying to you know make everything more green uh, while also trying to keep the prices down as much as possible. Um, it can also be used for improvements. Uh, if you have a house built in the 1950s, most likely it's not very energy efficient. There's going to be some cracks. There's going to be some uh, a lot of stuff to let you know your cold air out or your hot air out or hot air in. Uh, there's the the windows are most likely not going to be um, as efficient as they are today. They're not going to have that high R factor uh, that you know, we were talking about last class in regards to windows or doors, the retention of energy. Um, so you can get it, uh, you can get an energy efficient mortgage uh, as well uh, to make improvements to your home. So uh, some people do that. Now, um, these home equity conversion mortgage, uh, these are those reverse mortgages that we were talking about yesterday. 
uh, borrowing against the equity that you have in your home. Uh, you know, this is, this is not, you never want to let your clients get into this. You never want to uh, recommend anyone get into this. The only uh, people that we, you know, kind of advise this for um, is elderly people. Like I was saying yesterday, senior citizens who have no form of income, uh, they have no way of making money, uh, but they own their house. Well, they can take um, these reverse mortgages and get, you know, those monthly payments um, on the equity of their house uh, to give them some some cash flow, some spending money to, to do whatever they so please. Uh, but obviously, only if they're way, way old, or, or if they're in the older generation, you know, they're elderly, uh, you don't want to put anybody young in these reverse mortgages because it's just going to, uh, it's going to put them, put them in a big hole um, in the end. So, um, and then Good Neighbor Next Door, uh, I hope you all remember Good Neighbor Next Door. We talked about that for about 30 to 45 minutes uh, and went through multiple different websites and uh, kind of talked about that uh, program as a whole. Obviously, it's for law enforcement, educators, firefighters, EMTs, nurses, um, those type of people. Um, you know, they're able to get uh, those homes that are offered through HUD. Uh, they're able to get them for half price. So uh, that's always something good to keep in your back pocket. Keep in mind because uh, there's um, there's always people. Uh, you're going to run into a lot of a lot of uh, people in these professions. And if you're able to offer that to them, uh, they will love you for it. Um, and then those home ownership vouchers, um, you know, this is talking about, uh, you know, if, if a single mother with two kids who's barely scraping by, um, having a tough time paying the mortgage on her home, paying the notes, um, she can apply for uh, some of these home ownership vouchers. And what that is, is a grant and um, why do you have to pay grants back to the government? No, no, so it's free. Um, what, what it is, it's typically one to two months of that note uh, will be paid by the government. Um, so, I mean, this is, this is something that um, it is very big, but it's very, very hard to qualify for. I've heard stories where, um, you know, it was, that, it was that situation where there was a single mother, two kids making minimum wage um, struggling like on her last limb and it was hard to make payments um, and she did not qualify for those home ownership vouchers so um, and it is included in this uh, slideshow but it is it's, it's very hard to qualify for which is which is very sad and unfortunate um, but uh, yeah it's a part of it so uh, I hate that they they can't um, they can't make those qualifications a little bit easier uh, but that's just how you know the government is um, they love to take your money, but they're very stingy, stingy to give it back. So uh, that's just how they work. Um, now, talking about the FHA uh, underwriting guidelines, um, you know, as we said, the FHA, you know, they set maximum loan limits. Um, it's set geographically. Um, now, why is it set geographically, you may ask? Well, if you look at the price of homes in Texas right now, um, they're getting pretty high. Uh, you know, it's it's raised, you know, twenty to fifty thousand on average, kind of in the past year, um, and especially right now with how hot everything is, um, you know, prices are skyrocketing. Um, but when you look at houses in North Carolina, they're still dirt cheap relative to Texas. And then you look at places like California, and I mean everything's just burning up over there. The, the market's so hot. I mean, houses are selling, little shacks are selling for, you know, eight, 900,000 uh, just because it's a place in California. So uh, that's why they set these, these uh, loan limits um, by geography. Uh, obviously it's gonna vary state by state um, and really within the states it'll vary as well. Um, the down payment, uh, like, like it was said in the video, the down payment for um, an FHA loan um, is only 3.5%. So for every $100,000 of house you're buying, you only have 3,500 to put down. Uh, makes it a lot more reasonable as compared to 20%. But um, if you go two points down, you are gonna have those MIPs, those mortgage insurance premium um, costs uh, throughout the life of the loan. So uh, you wanna be careful for that. Um, in qual income qualifications, uh, 
you know, the FHA is typically sits around 31 to 43 um, percent debt to income ratio. Um, mortgage ins insurance premiums, there's, uh, you know, it's the government, so there's going to be a payment up front, um, an annual premium, and also a monthly uh, included in your note. Um, it'll be that those MIPs will be included. So um, a bunch of costs there that um, unfortunately will stay through the life of the loan. Uh, so it's just something to keep in mind. Um, obviously, like I said, I haven't said it yet today. Uh, you don't need to know every single detail about these. Uh, you just have to know the ba very basics, the, speci uh, the basics of everything. So uh, keep that in mind in going through this. Um, they do. Um, there are some allowable closing costs. A seller can pay some, buyer can pay some. Uh, that's not very strict in the FHA, on, in FHA guidelines. Um, until it comes to the seller contribution, uh, it can only be up to 6% of the sales price. And, you know, this is back to that situation that I was trying to give the other day, uh, but it didn't come out right. It, it was, ended up being terrible and didn't make sense. Um, you know, seller can only contribute 6% of the self sales price, the closing costs, um, back to the buyer. Uh, so you want to keep that in mind. Um, anytime you see a, a huge number in seller, co uh, seller contributions, uh, you want to be, you want to make sure it's not that 6% if it's FHA insured because um, I've heard of stories where they get to closing and, you know, that 6% is, um, it's, you know, is around 7.2%, 7.5%. Um, and, you know, is either, you know, the deal falls through or one of the agents give up some of their commission to make up those seller contributions, drop that down to six, and then uh, the agent's commission make up for it. So you definitely want to uh, catch all that out in front, uh, so you're not having to get to closing thinking you're going to get a, you know, a, a check for you know eight, nine thousand dollars, and then you only get a check for, you know, six or seven. I mean, it's going to be a little upsetting when you when you leave there. It's still going to be nice, but it's going to be upsetting. So you want to keep that in the back of your head. Um, a uh, second mortgage, um, second mortgages are allowed. Um, like as we said yesterday, I mean you can borrow from multiple lenders uh, through FHA insured loans, uh, but it's very, very, it's very rare uh, that they allow that. They typically want to keep it all in one um, pile so they can keep everything in track. Uh, they don't, they don't typically allow just a second mortgage for any property. It's very, very strict. Um, but they do allow assumptions of of loans. Um, but the borrower must qualify for the terms of the loan that the seller um, already has. So um, if they do qualify, then you're good to go. Um, if they don't, uh, you're not going to be allowed. So next meeting. Uh, a little more about the FHA 203K purchase and rehab loan. Um, you know, the rehabs, uh, the rehab costs must be at least $5,000, like I said. Uh, you know, you can get a 203K uh, to just fix up a property um, that you already live in, or um, you can, you can uh, obviously get it to uh, buy the purchase and um, the rehab. That's why it's purchase and rehab. Uh, you can get a, a full 203K loan to buy the property and to also fix her up um, for flipping and, and, you know, turn a profit on that. Um, more to bring. Yeah, the uh, can add more to bring to FHA standards. Uh, yeah, so I mean, you can add more money uh, or you know add more repairs uh, to bring it up to the FHA standards to be able to uh, apply for the loan. Um, and then the borrower on that loan uh, must pay taxes and insurance for six months, um, even if they fix it up, sell it uh, in a matter of three months. Uh, the lender or the borrower on that loan must pay the taxes and insurance for six months. So that's kind of where, that's the only time you'll hear of a situation like that. Um, other words, it's going to be like the proration of insurance and taxes uh, through throughout the year, um, like we typically do 99% of the time. Um, yesterday, um, we were talking about construction loans and how they, are, um, they were paid in draws. Um, the same thing for these uh, purchase and rehab loans, these two or three Ks. Um, you know, they're only going to give you so much for, uh, you know, installing counters 
and they're only going to give you so much. Um, and once you install the counters and bring them receipts, okay, well then they're going to let you bring the electricians in. And so they're only going to give you enough to um, bring the electricians in. And, and typically to uh, be able to pull these funds, uh, you're going to need to take bids that you have gotten um, from contractors and take them to the bank and show that you're actually getting bids and uh, that you're actually doing this work. Because there's a lot of people, um, when they started offering these, uh, they would, uh, what they would do is, you know, they would say, oh, um, well, I'm gonna buy, I need $500,000 to, um, you know, uh, recoup this home and so I can flip it. Like I, I'm gonna take out a, a construction loan for 500,000 or a, a 203K for 500,000. And then what they would do is they would only, you know, put 150,000 into the property, and then try to pocket that other, uh, you know, 350. Um, so once that kind of got found out, banks really tightened up um, and really made their policy strict. That's why they require bids, and they now only hand out those payments and draw draws, um, making sure that um, there were also contractors who were, uh, you know charging themselves um, 150 in labor costs uh, to, you know, to rehab these homes. So not only were they selling homes for a profit, but they were also taking the 150,000 from the bank and um, stuffing that in their pocket as well. So that's why we, um, these policies are pretty strict now um, and the funds are paid in draws. Uh, the rehab costs, exactly like I was saying, uh, the cost must be approved before the loans are given out you have to take bids up there um, and get them inspected by the loan officers um, and they will decide whether or not to give you those uh, funds. Um, energy efficiency and structural standards must be met. Um, with these two or three Ks, there are, there are pretty specific um, energy and structural standards uh, that you have to meet to be able to require, be required to be able to be approved for these loans. Um, so they are typically, um, that's why you kind of have to take everything in beforehand, blueprints, all that, and show that you are going to meet these requirements. Um, but these are, it's not available for investors who just want to, uh, you know, buy the property and sit on it and rent it. It's for flipping purposes, um, you know, to just kind of, to kind of revamp uh, the homes in the community uh, that it's in. So, uh, FHA arm and refinance. Uh, going into that section 251, the arm, um, they do, there is a maximum loan amount and a down payment. Uh, and the qualifying standards are, are the same for the 203B. Uh, and that is, if you remember the one to four family, uh, in regards to that, the, in the FHA insurance on that, um, they offer one and three year arms. Um, the annual cap is 1% and the life of the loan cap is 5%. So um, each year, um, I guarantee you, I mean, if you get one of these, these section 251 arms, um, every year they will raise it a full percent. Uh, they were, are going to interest raise that interest rate, uh, full, a full, uh, a full percent each year. So if you start off with, you know, two, um, you know, by that second year, it's going to be three and at year five, it's going to be seven and they're going to let it sit at seven for the life of that loan, uh, trying to make as much money as they can. Um, that's what banks are, they're a business, they're here to make money. Uh, so they're gonna leave it at 7% and um, really put you kind of in a hole financially. Um, they also streamline refinance. Uh, it, this is FHA insured. Um, they keep current in their payments. Uh, most results in a lower payment after some time um, and no cash is taken out of that. Um, FHA contributions to real estate finance. Um, Obviously, they, you know, they have written uh, the basic standards. They came out with the basic standards of, you know, three and a half percent down, uh, you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, so they set the standards for qualifying borrowers. And uh, that's typically what banks, um, what banks use nowadays. Um, and banks have, have even uh, tightened up their, their own policies. So um, FHA, these FHA standards are kind of bottom, bottom of the line. Um, requirements. Uh, if you go to turn to more conventional loans, they're going to have a lot more requirements and a lot more uh, guidelines that you have to abide by. Um, they also raise the standards for appraising properties. 
they, you know, and, you know, I've talked about appraisers for, you know, already like five minutes today, so I don't need to go back into the whole lot, but, you know, the after 08 appraisals and making sure that they were legitimate and that the appraisers are doing their job correctly, um, that was heavily regulated by the FHA. Um, sometimes they were even double, triple checked. Um, uh, uh, yes. So, um, anyways, long term, long term amortized loans. Uh, this is, you know, they the FHA kind of started out on this. Um, you know, back in the day, they didn't do a whole lot of thirty years, um, but. You know, obviously banks realized uh, that they can do uh, these 30 year loans and obviously how to make uh, banks make money off of what? Uh, it starts with an I. Okay. Oh, interest. Yeah, interest. Yeah, so banks make money off interest. The longer you're paying on that loan, the longer you're paying on that interest, the more money they're making in the end. Uh, so, you know, that's why they kind of adopted these long long-term amortized loans. Um, and then they also pr uh, provided the foundation for the national market and in mortgage-backed securities um, and the sale of these MSBs into the second market, the secondary market, not the second market. Um, I hope you all you all know or remember what the secondary market is. Um, what are you going to get your loans for? Exactly. Yeah. So, um, they're talking about VA uh, guaranteed. This is the last little bit here. Um, you know, they do have a guarantee of 25% of current performing limits. Um, eligibility and entitlement is a very, very big thing uh, in VA loans. Like he said in the video, um, you know, it, it depends on length of service as well. Um, you know, if you, if you just go in there and give a give, give the minimal stint, um, you're probably not going to be able to qualify very soon for a VA loan. Uh, you're going to have to wait a while. Um, and then also, um, if you're, you know, even if you're in the service for, um, you know, 35 years and you're dishonorably discharged, um, you won't be able to get that that certificate of eligibility. Um, so yeah, it, anytime you're dealing with a VA loan and um, I'm dealing with a VA loan right now, and it's very, very, very difficult um, to get the sellers to uh, come around on a VA loan, uh, like you said in the video. There's a lot of requirements, um, a lot of kind of hoops that you have to jump through and extra stuff that you have to do um, to uh, be accepted on a VA loan. Um, and, you know, talking about that certificate of eligibility, um, you know, there's been cases where um, veterans have, um, you know, uh, gone out for the loan and uh, their loan officer wrote it up, said they were good, um, went to, found a real estate agent, um, was able to find a house, got to closing and, uh, you know, the loan officer finds out that, oh, you're, um, it says here that uh, you were dishonorably discharged and you don't have a certificate of eligibility. Um, well, when that is becomes is the case, uh, the whole deal falls through. So anytime talking about a VA loan, you want to make sure that you have that certificate of eligibility. Um, and they, partial entitlement um, has a little bit to do with it, um, you know, depending on how long they were in the service, like it says up top. Um, you know, they... Anytime you're talking with a VA loan, uh, you want to make sure that the lender that you're dealing with is experienced in VA loans, uh, because there is a lot of hoops to jump through on our side and a lot of extra steps that you have to go through on our side. Um, but when you're talking about the lending process of it all, it's very, it's a lot, lot more intricate um, on their end for VA loans uh, because it is zero down. Um, and there is so many benefits uh, to veterans um, in the purchase of a house. So I, if you know you have a, a loan officer that you're talking to and, and they say, oh, you know, this is my first VA loan, we're just trying it out. Um, that should be a very big red flag to you. Um, even if 
students. Now going back, lenders do have to have BBA certified. Uh, they do have to have a very uh, a specific certificate uh, and they have to go through an extra training uh, to be able to process these loans. Um, but you know, once they do, if they're not very experienced in them and they're not getting a lot of help on their side, um, it's going to be very, very difficult then for them to process that loan because there is uh, so much to it and the smallest thing regarding the VA loan uh, can make the whole deal just completely shattered. So you want to make sure your, uh, your loan officer is good. Um, my own loan officer that I'm dealing with right now, um, fortunately, he's great. Um, and my clients actually came to me with him. Um, he came along with them, so I didn't have to go find him. I didn't have to, uh, you know, go search one out and find a good VA lender. Um, he's based out of the DFW area. He knows his stuff very well. Um, anytime I call him and have any questions, he knows the answers are off the top of his head. Uh, so I'm very confident in, um, you know, in our transaction that we're going through right now and, and you know, keeping our fingers crossed uh, that it doesn't fall through. Because the very slightest thing on a VA loan um, can make it fall through. Um, and then the certificate of reasonable, reasonable value, uh, this is going to be required. And the certificate of reasonable value in regards to VA loans, um, it's talking about the appraisals. Uh, this, the CRV, as we call them, um, is technically just an appraisal. Um, but these appraisals, uh, and the appraisers um, have to go through more a um, more stringent training process than your typical appraiser. Uh, so, you know, and not only do they have to go through uh, once, and uh, they will search for, you know, look for, you know, anything in the foundation, in the roof, um, that kind of thing. Uh, they're also um, certified to, uh, to do WDI inspections. Um, which I talked about earlier, those wood destroying insects. Um, they'll do a, a termite inspection as well, all in one swoop. Um, and with, so with this cert specific certification, uh, they're a lot more uh, vigilant in their inspection process. And not only do they come out once and do one appraisal uh, and inspect, they also come out and do a second appraisal inspection. Um, so, you know, like I said, there's a lot of stuff that you have to jump through and you have to be on top of when dealing with the VA loan. So um, if you ever run into a client uh, that is uh, certified for a VA loan, uh, has their certificate of eligibility, uh, make sure you have a good lender and make sure you're on top of your game because it's it's a, it's a little bit different. It's, a, it's actually a lot different than any other um, conventional or any other governmental loan. And your VA qualifying uh, requirements, uh, your income, uh, your 40 month, 41% uh, of your gross monthly income, uh, it can exceed your, your payment. Uh, there is some residual income required, um, whether it be through the VA in, in term of payments or a different type. Uh, you do need to have some sort of uh, secondary income coming in uh, to be able to qualify. Um, there are compensating factors. Uh, closing costs, all may be paid to seller, be paid by seller plus 4%. Um, you know, typically, uh, it is required for the seller to pay the majority of the closing costs in the VA loan. Um, but they've kind of changed up those requirements, uh, thankfully, because you know, in my transaction that I'm dealing with right now, um, if we were to submit an offer in, on a house for um, say 300,000 um, and that's competitive with all other offers. Um, but my, since ours is a VA loan, the sellers are made or are required to make concessions of $10,000 back. Well, I mean, why if I gave you the option, um, you have a house, you're selling your house and you have one for 300,000 and then you have one for 300,000 but you have to get 10,000 back to the buyer, um, who are you going to be, which one are you going to be choosing? Yeah, exactly. You're going to be choosing the 300,000 without any concessions made. Um, so there were some rule changes. Um, and so right now with my clients, um, we are not offering or we're not asking for anything in seller concessions, even though we are a VA loan. 
um, just to stay competitive within the market. Um, so it's really good that they did that now. Um, funding fees, uh, higher for reservists, reservists and subsequent use. Um, yeah, some of the funding fees are higher uh, depending on the typical the, the situation that you're in. So and then VA and miscel uh, miscellaneous stuff. Um, second mortgage. Um, a second mortgage is allowed um, with no restrictions. Uh, buy down those buy down points. They are available. Um, you know, I, like we talked about yesterday. You know, they'll give you the option. Hey, bring you know five to ten thousand dollars at closing, and we'll we'll knock your interest rate down at like one percent or whatever. So that is still available um, in VA loans. Um, you can assume um, a loan through a VA um, with lender approval of buyer. Um, again, with, uh, as long as same with all other VA loans, um, they're going to be very particular in what they allow you to assume. Um, they're going to go through your your income. All, like, uh, everything I've said before, they're going to go through it very stringently, um, especially dealing in regards to VA loans. Um, they're going to make sure that they are uh, able to make those payments. Um, release of liability innovation. Um, now, this is, you know, you're only, um, this is talking about, you know, the re release of lo one loan to take, take out another. Um, and, you know, in regards to FHA loans or other government loans, you can have multiple going on at one time. Um, but when it comes to VA loans, a veteran can only have one VA loan outstanding at any point in time. Um, so if they are, um, if they are selling their house and they're trying to get into another house, um, they won't be able to, they won't qualify for another VA loan until their house is sold and their, their previous uh, VA loan is paid off. Um, so they're only allowed one loan. Uh, you just want to keep that in mind. Uh, substitution of entitlement allows veterans to, to refuse enti reuse entitlement. Uh, that's kind of talking about um, they can drop their loan as long as it's paid off and then pick up another one right off the bat without um, without any stopping. So, uh, and then the, they have uh, adjustable rate mortgages. Um, they have one fifth caps, which that's just one percent every five years. Um, so it's a lot more arms or a lot more feasible in a for a, in a VA loan because it can only move 1% every five years. So it's not 1% every year, um, one every five. And then they do the streamlined financing as well. Um, and that, that is going to, um, that'll be it for uh, the lecture today. Um, does anyone uh, have any questions before we go? Everyone's good, I think. I hope. All right. So, um, yeah, it was, it was a very short uh, lecture tonight. Um, thankfully, uh, we'll probably, um, you know, you only have.